Hi, I'm Mickey Tebeka. I'm a developer for 27 years now. I've uh, been doing a lot of things from writing books to writing software. I do write code on a daily basis to customers and open source. And with that, I do a lot of serialization, really too much. So we're going to talk about one format of serialization, which is JSON. And uh, we're going to look a little bit about serialization in general, and then dive into the uh, details of JSON and specifically how they work with JSON with Go. Let's start by just talking about serialization and why do we need it? So serialization is taking a data structure in your language, say a slice or maybe um, a map, but it can even be a string or an integer and you convert it to a sequence of bytes and then back. The question is why, why do we need it at all? And the answer is that under the hood, when you look at the hardware, the hardware doesn't understand any concept of uh, data structures. It just bits and bytes all over the hardware. So every time that you need to pass data from one place to another, you are going to look at bytes and you're going to convert these bytes back and forth from your program and back. And serialization, the idea sounds really simple, right? Take an integer, make it a sequence of bytes and then back, but it can get really tricky and some things are really complicated. The example you see right now on the slide is a serialization of the string serialization with these uh, bigger than and smaller than signs uh, to the sequence of bytes. And this format of serialization is known as UTF-8 encoding. And we're not going to go into Unicode, that's a whole new talk. But uh, if you're dealing with Unicode, you probably know it's not easy. So civilization can be really tricky uh, with format where, where you put the bytes, you want uh, things to be um, fast and efficient. Uh, so there are many considerations. So before we dive in specifically to JSON, I'd like to talk about some mistakes that people do uh, when dealing with serialization. Uh, so if you look at the slide, we have the common three layers uh, that we say on of uh, a program, right? We have the API layer, the one that communicates with the clients. They can be REST clients, they can be maybe some kind of a UI and other things. Then you have the business layer. The business layer is the one that's actually doing the work. All the smarts is going in the business layer. And down below the business layer, we have the storage link. This is where we store data and keep it for uh, later. Usually it's a database, but uh, parquet files, you name it. There are many, many ways to keep data in storage. And the first mistake is that serialization should be only at the edges of your program. So when the API layer talks to someone on the outside, and the storage layer is keeping data. This is where you do serialization. And writing to a database, it is a serialization action, right? We have the integer in Go, and we have the integer in, a, let's say, Postgres SQL. It's a different integer. Can be, not, not necessarily. And we, will, we need to convert them back and forth. So the mistake is that you continue to do serialization, even you talk between the API and the business layer and the business layer and the storage layer. In these places, you should be talking only in native type. So for example, let's say in the API, you got this some kind of a timestamp and it comes in as a string. What you should do in your API layer is convert this string to go time to time. And then between the API and the business and between the business and the storage, always use the native type of time to time. And don't do every time pass a string and then someone needs to do this serialization from the string to at the time, this is redundant. And when we talk about performance, this is really heavy on performance. I spend a fair amount of time optimizing services for clients, and, and this is a common mistake that they see. They're just reparsing the same time string again and again and again in every function call. This is very bad. So only on the outside layers, only on the ones that are um, connected to the outside world, let's say, and you need to do serialization. Once you are in the same memory space, right? So the same process, go teams share the same memory space, there's no need for serialization. 
you can pass native types, it's going to be faster, more efficient, and you will get type safety, which is another big plus. So this is the first mistake that we can see. The second mistake is that people are using the same types throughout these three layers. So let's say I have a user and I have the same user for the business layer, the storage layer, and the API. Layer. And at the beginning, right, they are going to look the same. And maybe just a login and a, a name, maybe some permissions, but that's it. But the thing is, now you're tying these layers all together. So if you think about developing something with a document-based database, such as MongoDB or maybe Elasticsearch, it's really easy to say, the client asked me for a document, gave me an ID, I go to the database, gets this document by ID and just push it out to the user all the way. Very little amount of work on my side. But you're tying all of these layers together and there are several issues with it. One is someone makes a change to the storage layer. Maybe they renamed the fields. Maybe they added some kind of fields that you don't want to go out. Maybe there's the user address of the user in the storage layer, and you don't want that because a regulation like GDPR and other things. So you need to be careful about what you're sending out. And the second issue is that if you look on the left side, each of these layers have a different velocity of development. The amount of changes per time is really different. Your API layer, it should be really, really stable, right? You know that every time you change something in the API, all the users gets angry. So API layers are usually very stable until you do a major change like V2 or V3, but that's that's a big if. So the API layer, once you think about it, uh, usually keeps stable. The business layer is the one that has the highest development velocity. You add rules, you add features, you add other things. Uh, so this is going to change and data structures are going to change much faster in the user layer, in the business layer, sorry, versus the API. And finally, we have the uh, storage layer. I would say this is a medium velocity. Most of the time it's pretty stable, but you know, we add a column to a table or we add a field to something else. So this is a, a different velocity. And if you keep the same user structure throughout these layers, uh, there's going to be some tension between the business layer want to change and add things. The API layer want to keep it really, really uh, simple and same. So I recommend having one type of user per uh, each layer. And at the beginning of the project, this is going to look redundant, but it's going to pay off in uh, the future when you start seeing changes. And also, every time you see someone going through a lot of hoops in the API layer, passing what the user is sending and trying to match it, to some kind of struct that the business layer is using, this is a good sign that there's no separation and you're tying these layers. So this is mistake number two. And the last mistake is that assuming that once we have a valid JSON, a valid serialization anyway, you know, it can be XML or YAML or whatever, this is valid data. And this is not true, right? We have a very simple message that contains a latitude and longitude. And this is a valid JSON. If you run it through a JSON, this is fine. But the problem is that longitudes can go up to 180, no more than that. And here we have 192. So every time you get some data, you have to validate it. And I see people skimming that all the time because validation is a, it's a tough issue. It's really hard to validate data to make sure that your assumptions on the data are good and that everything is working. But it's well worth the investment. So don't assume that just because the user send you a valid JSON, the request that you're sending is valid. You need to validate again and again. There are libraries uh, that you can use to, to validate, uh, but I tend to do it manually. I just write a validate function, and then I write all my assumptions in code. I found out that all of these libraries, uh, there's the one from the playground, um, they're, they're giving me a lot of benefit, but they're usually missing something, especially if I have code dependencies between uh, two fields. Let's say I have a person height and a person weight. I can't have uh, a very, very tall person weighing only uh, very little. So sometimes I even have some um, dependencies between two fields that I need to do validation, and most of these frameworks don't, don't see it. 